The New Testament reading is from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it. Now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord. He put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came with the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard, and hauled the net ashore, full of a large fish, near 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wasn't putting down New Jersey. There are some beautiful parts of New Jersey. I went to school there for seminary. I was blessed to be there. But it gets cold. Of course, it does get a little hot here. Occasionally. In 2016, a researcher conducted an experiment on the topic of how people make choices and the level of satisfaction with the choices that they make. In a series of internet advertisements, the researcher invited people who were having difficulty making life-altering decisions to visit his website if they wished to receive help. On the site, people could choose from one of 30 questions, 10 questions of which were labeled important. Now, examples of the important questions were, should I quit my job? Should I leave my spouse or my significant other? Should I go back to school? Should I get engaged? We know those questions cause we may have them now. Or he certainly had them before. Participants were asked to choose the one question that plagued them the most and then invited them to flip a digital coin and call heads or tails. After flipping the coin, their choice was revealed. Heads meant make the change. Tails meant keep the status quo. The researcher asked participants to fill out a survey both two months later and six months later to see first if they actually made their choice based on the random coin toss and second if they were satisfied with the choice that the coin had made for them. The coin was flipped 22,000 times. In two months, the project received back 13,000 surveys. And in six months, it received back 8,000 surveys. So they got a really good sample. That's a great sample. 
and the results were both remarkable and unexpected. Some of the participants, of course, did not let the coin toss make the decision for them, but most did. For the less important decisions, about 67% followed the random choice of the coin toss. For the most important life-altering decisions, such as should I leave my significant other, more than half obeyed the random side of the coin toss. Of the coin toss. Even more amazing, those who followed the decision of the coin said they were substantially happier with their lives in making the change compared to those who did not reach, who refused to follow the coin toss. This proved to be true not only two months later, but six months after the experiment. And surprisingly, those who made the biggest decisions based upon the toss of a digital coin expressed the most satisfaction with what they did. Whatever the coin told them, they expressed the most satisfaction. So, what was the point of the experiment? Because it does have a point. In characterizing his research, the scientists concluded that sometimes the biggest decision of our lives is hardly a decision at all. Instead, they're the result of some choice that we never actually made and that it is better to move toward action more often than inaction. As humans, we are addicted to the status quo, not so much because it is better, but because it is comfortable, it is familiar. And we will remain with the status quo even if it is blocking us from finding fulfillment. Other researchers have found that over a lifetime, people are more likely to regret inaction than action. Listen again. Researchers have found that over our lifetimes, people are more likely to regret inaction as compared to taking action. And now we come to our story. It's a remarkable story. Gospel of John. Because the disciples of Christ talk about change, talk about a change in status quo, they have experienced an unimaginable change. Not just in their lives, but in humanity's basic understanding of existence. A change in the nature of being itself. Jesus had risen and had appeared to many by the time we reached this point in John's Gospel. Would you be surprised that this news was difficult for some of those who heard it? And even it was difficult for some of those who had actually seen the risen Christ. What I love about the Gospels is they are, they are just blatantly honest. They do not hide the skepticism of those who struggle to accept the fact that Jesus indeed was alive. Not a ghost, not a vision, that that was his body. That was a struggle even for those who were closest to Christ, such as the apostles. Now the story doesn't tell us why several apostles, there were seven of them that we can count in the story, decided to fish all night in the Sea of Galilee as they waited for the risen Christ. Christ had directed them to meet Him there. The risen Christ. I'll meet you there. Some commentators surmise that Peter, ashamed because of his denial of Christ, decided to return to his previous life as a fisherman. Assume that Jesus would never receive him back as an apostle because he had denied him. But there's a more plausible explanation. And it's simple. 
It is that that group of seven disciples, not knowing how long they were going to have to wait for Christ, decided they needed provisions. And there was all the provision they needed in the Sea of Galilee. And there were the boats. All they needed to do to provide for themselves as they waited for Christ to appear was to catch fish. And they knew how to do that. The fact that, that these skilled fishermen caught nothing the entire evening directly led to their encounter with the risen Lord, yes, at what time? Daybreak. And that's not a coincidence. Imagine, they hear this, they see this figure on the shore. The sun is rising from the east. They're looking east. And they're blinded. Maybe they make out a figure, but they definitely hear a voice. The voice says, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. And of course, we know what happened. The successful catch that resulted had nothing to do with the direction of where they cast their nets. It had to do entirely with the apostles' willingness to make the choice that they were given to act instead of ignore the call from that figure standing on the shore. You'll remember that Peter and the others had made the same choice several years before when they began their journey with Jesus as their teacher. Now, they were offered the choice from the one who invited him, them, them to journey with him again, but this time as their Savior, as their Messiah. And what did they do in accepting that call? They received all the provisions that they would ever need. They received enough provisions literally beyond their ability to eat. And that was the meaning of that miracle. I'll provide you all that you need. When they finally made it to shore, except for Peter, of course, kind of impulsive, who had, you know, he's probably ADHD, I'm betting. I mean, it comes across that way. It's just impulsive, right? He jumped in the water to swim ahead of him. I know because I'm, I'm ADHD as well. He jumped in the water to swim ahead of him. And when they all finally brought their boats to shore, 300 yards, uh, 300 feet, there were 300 feet out, about 100 yards, what was waiting for them there on the beach? It was a meal, a meal that the risen Christ himself had prepared for them. Now, here we are, 2,000 years later, sitting and standing in front of the same meal the risen Christ has prepared for us this morning. The ingredients are a little different, but it's still the same old calling us to make our decision of where we will cast our nets in life. It's interesting that after the resurrection, it is no longer in the physical that Jesus is recognized. It is instead a spiritual recognition. You remember? We see it over and over again in the garden when Mary Magdalene does not immediately recognize Christ on the road to Emmaus when the two disciples are only able to recognize Christ when he breaks bread for them after a long day's journey. And here, when Christ once again breaks bread for them on the beach, after having provided for his beloved followers more fish than they could ever eat. This morning, the Son of God has provided for us more than we will ever need to carry His name and to bring His love into this world. But we still must make a choice. Fortunately, not a choice based upon the digital toss of a coin, but one based upon faith. Those are hard choices too. 
sometimes incredibly hard. So upon which side are you and I going to cast the nets of our lives and for what purposes? Our own? Most of the world does that. Or Christ's. In the foreword of one of his books, Archbishop Desmond Tutu makes it clear that there is no place for neutrality or indecision in the kingdom of God. Here's what Tutu writes. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. If an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, and you say that you are neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. Amen. Christianity is a life in opposition to those things which crush the hearts of humanity. Hate and poverty and despair, spiritual tyranny, suffering and evil in all of its many manifestations. Christianity is a sign upon which we stand, upon which we live. And when we come to this table, it is not to proclaim that God is on our side, but to offer ourselves to God's side, asking for His grace that we may be made worthy of being on God's side. That was the work of Christ. That's what he did. Are we prepared to hear the Messiah's voice? Are we prepared to cast our nets in obedience and receive what he has come to give us? A life of purpose, a life of meaning, a life everlasting. If so, if that's the choice that we would make. Christ has prepared a meal for us. And it's here, waiting for us to eat, giving us more than we will ever need in this world to do His work. So let us join our hearts with our Lord this morning, and let us share His meeting. Amen.